Hello and welcome to this episode of Civic Conversations. I'm so excited that you're here to talk about this really essential topic with us. My name is Rachel Davison Humphreys. I am Director of Outreach at the Bill of Rights Institute. I was a classroom teacher for many years, uh, before that almost 10 years, across the continent, doing lots of really fun things with students directly, engaging them with big ideas. And that's why I'm so excited to invite my dear friend, Nichelle Pickney, um, to join us. So Nichelle has been a social studies educator for the past 16 years as a classroom, then K-12 curriculum director. She's presented and trained nationally and internationally. She holds her master's uh, in educational administration from, from Lamar and a bachelor's degree from Salem College in sociology with a women's studies minor. Michelle's found a passion for providing equitable education to every student, and she's worked to revise, curric revise curriculum to assure it's diverse, equitable, and inclusive for all students and teachers. And the way that I came to know Michelle is because she just published a new book. Michelle, can you tell us a little bit about your book? Um, thank you so much, Rachel, for introducing me. Um, yes, I am the co-author of Civil Discourse, Classroom Conversations for a Stronger Community. Um, I wrote this book with Joe Schmidt, and... Um, Funny story, I tell people all the time, we talk about social media all the time about how it's not good and all that. Well, something great came out of social media for me, the book. Um, I met Joe online and we wrote the book via online and just really talking about the civil discourse that we need in our classrooms and really just a guide on how to get through it and how to be able to do it in your classrooms. Well, and, and that's actually how we met because Joe recently came on as the director of programs at BRI and it was at one of our curriculum development seminars where we're building new resources that you two met for the first time yes. in person because you had, you, yes. had read, you had written a whole book together but never been in the same room, which is a marvel of modern modernity that yes. that was the case. Um, well, so these essential conversations are why I invited you to this um, this episode of Civic Conversations, because the Bill of Rights Institute recently republished a resource uh, called Being an American, which is a primary source, written assignment, discussion prompt kind of very active resource that focuses on exploring the meaning of citizenship to current current Americans, but also Americans in the past. We we update we updated it and relaunched it to include more differentiated learning approaches and use in the lower grades, which could be valuable, uh, lower reading levels, which which we thought would be valuable for ESL ESL students, and lessons all contain vocabulary glossaries and shortened versions of primary sources uh, to hold students' attention while fostering critical thinking. The resource itself is actually eleven different lessons that kind of span a lot of the philosophical foundation of what it means to be American while tying it to Americans who have demonstrated what it means to be American throughout history. Uh, it looks at kind of American principles and virtues and then kind of the enlightenment, declaration of independence, all the stuff you'd expect. But then it goes into uh, the heroes past and present with a capstone project that asks students what being an American means to them. So it was really exciting to relaunch this resource and have our have our uh, our educators, our network of educators, take a look at it. But I wanted to talk with you, Nichelle, about you focus on civil discourse and difficult conversations in the classroom. What do you know about these conversations about what it means to be American? How have you helped teachers, help teachers in your district, kind of talk through and think through the, even the idea that there's this common what it means? So um, I always say the biggest thing is we have to be able to speak the same language, right? And so with students, the first thing I would hope my students would ask is, well, what do you mean when you say American? Like, what does that look like? Um, especially where I live, we have a large immigrant population. And so that it would be the first converse, like the first thing that they would say is, well, what do you mean when you say American? Like, what, what entitles me? To be an American is that citizenship is that um, because I live here and I um, participate within the process, but yet I've yet to become a citizen. Is that because I was born here with and my family was an American, but I really don't know what that means. So really, kind of establishing a definition of what we consider to be American, and then not just um, 
from nationality, but from like that value system that you talk about. Like, does an American, just because I'm born here, does that mean that I'm truly being an American? Or is it a value system and a code of ethics that I hold and then defining what each one of those mean? And so really allowing students to, to so that we all know that we have this conversation of if we're saying humility is one of those values and um, trustworthiness and, um, um, Ooh, let's see what other words I can use. Like just those two alone. Like how do we define those? What does that look like? And um, has it changed over time? So it's, does that look the same from as early of the enlightenment period versus um, early 2000s to, to right now? What does that look like? Does it transcend over time? So that's how I would really defining what is it first? Like, and how do we, um, how do we build almost like a rubric of what that looks like? <laughs> And that definitional work is really hard for, for mm -hmm. students. Uh, these are complex terms and issues. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are ways in which they, of course, have access to the ideas because they're, they're pretty common across American, you know, uh, American society. But at the same time, they're pretty abstract, right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. how, do, how do we do that as, as a community? as a uh, as a as a society how do we take a how do we define our virtues what are what are the things that we um that we hold dear well luckily the bill of rights institute actually thinks about this quite a bit <laughs> you may have known that uh, and we have a whole list of virtues and their attendant vices which is really interesting to think about and so one of the things i want to make sure that we're um we're we we voice and we're aware of is that when we talk about american virtues they're not necessarily exclusive but what we're trying to do is find find universal things that bind us together in common humanity, right? And there is an open question for some people about whether there is a uniquely American set of virtues or whether there are virtues that are common across all people. You know, philosophers have thought about this for a long, long time, going all the way back to, you know, ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia and Greece and Rome and all the way up through the Enlightenment uh, to modern day asking, what is a good society? Who has access to the society? Uh, and what does it mean to train young people to be contributing members to a good society? You know, Plato's Republic was all about that. And that was written many hundreds of years ago, um, thousands of years ago. Uh, so uh, one of uh, the, our virtues, the, the virtues that the Bill of Rights have, you can find on our website. If you just type in principles and virtues or civic virtues, you'll come across the page. And they include courage, honor, humility, integrity, justice, moderation, prudence, respect, and responsibility. And then what we've done is we've actually said, not only are there these virtues, but then there are vices that are the, how does, uh, how is it defined? But every, every vice is a virtue in its extreme. So we have things like cowardice and dishonor and hubris and self-deception and injustice and immoderation or extremism and imprudence and contempt and irresponsibility. And so what we what we try and have really the question about what it means to be an American is a is a very personal question for students and for teachers. And so having that conversation can be really challenging. So you've thought a lot about kind of how to have challenging conversations. Can you give us some of the kind of tips uh, that you use when when doing your work, um, either with the book or in your district about how to approach these things that are ultimately really personal? for students and teachers? Well, so um, that is, I will say one thing I wanted to say, I love that you use the word contributing into society. That's a, a valuable word, that word contributing. Like, so I'm not just sitting back, I'm a part of a process and I love that. Um, so when we look at the, um, how do we have these conversations? So the first part, um, I think a lot of people, Joe and I really joke about that. We joke about it, but we're serious in that you cannot wake up um, tomorrow and sitting here watching the news and you're like, this is what we're going to talk about in class tomorrow. And day 89 of your class and you go in guns a blazing with this question, um, are you a true American? Do you fit these virtues? And go from there. It's not going to be, you may get lucky. And it may be a hit, but I'm going to go on the side of it probably is not. Um, because those questions that I drew up from the beginning 
are going to start happening, right? They're going to start like, what does she mean by that? Well, who decided these virtues and what did these mean? What's it like all these questions, which would be great, right? So the first thing we talk about is really building that common understanding once again, like what are we going to do when we agree to disagree? What are we going to do in... Um, a classroom where we may have students that don't think that they're American because um, maybe because of race, because of gender, because of sexuality, because of different things like that, that are vices that we may not want to acknowledge at that moment, but people use that to define um, their um, other appendage of being an American. I'm an American this, I'm an American that. And so having that conversation, so setting up the groundwork to how we identify ourselves is going to be really important. And then I would always say, start off with something easy because this is pretty intense. So start off with something really easy first. And then we kind of segue into having this conversation. So then the questions that I'm talking about that I would expect from my classes, I expect those questions because I would have already laid that groundwork with multiple opportunities for that to be the first question that they ask. So instead of them wanting to answer this question right away, they would genuinely have asked me, um, well, what do you mean to be an American? They would have asked me about every last one of those virtues, and I probably would have given them examples of who um, BRI or who I thought fit those examples, and then they would have attested, like, well, why? Because this person did, like, we had set the tone for those conversations, so really laying the groundwork for how you're going to be able to have students be able to answer this with fidelity, with uh, courage, with strength. Um, and then for everyone to understand that, okay, Rachel identifies with this because this, this, and this. Michelle identifies with this because this, this, and this. And it just kind of, it kind of works. And then that last part about knowing that maybe some people aren't going to agree with what's being said. And then how we can move on from that and understand that and just be like, that's cool. And still have a nice day and be able to go have, like I say, have an ice cream cone. I live in Texas. It's hot. It's winter time and it's 80 degrees. So go have an ice cream cone with this person. Have a sonic drink, even though we didn't agree with what we talked about. So being okay with that. I think that that's actually, that's 100% the way to start, right? This idea of the scaffolded conversation and kind of having the on-ramp into these conversations. You, you have to start with easy questions and you can tie those easy questions. Like it can be things like, what's the best American dessert, apple pie or brownie a la mode, right? Like, or whatever, whatever you decide, right? Like you can, yes. you can ask those kinds of kind of um, more low stakes questions mm -hmm. that are still getting at virtues and values. Like, I mean, there are regional tastes. Apple pie doesn't taste the same across the United States. You can ask what's the best soda flavor. That's always a good one um, because it varies widely regionally. Like cheer wine doesn't exist in Texas, but it exists in South Carolina. In uh, North Carolina. In North Carolina. <laughs> And right, like no one in Texas knows what cheer wine is, but no, maybe, maybe, uh, or like, you know, those sorts of things are, are do the work of creating the community of the classroom, yes. which you guys talk a lot about in your book too, that then allows the conversations about being an American to happen. Yes. Um, and I think that's, that's the other thing is kind of sometimes in these conversations, our students, uh, anchor in what is different about all of us. Yes. When we're trying to help them talk about what's common among yes. all of us. <laughs> and so what are, when, when students are at that kind of impasse, what are some things that you know to help them, help them work through, get to get to the things that are common? So um, I guess right now, because of the, I, the environment we live in that, um, this way or this way, black or white, um, and not even almost divisive, almost just separating, like we're going to classify. It's so funny because a lot of times, a lot of teachers for many years, we really wanted students to be able to classify and group things. And I think they struggled with it now, but I think they do a great job now at knowing, no, this is this, this is this, and they don't cross paths, right? And so being able to find that common ground, like you said, and so um, that comes with good questioning. Um, that also comes with, um, I'm going to give my age a little here, right? Um, the old school approach. So I would most definitely 
um, start off with um, an anchor chart. Yes, I was a high school teacher and I did anchor charts. And the anchor charts would be where I guide that conversation to be able to talk about um, what does, and I'm going to use us because we are the faces that we can see, right? So Rachel has believes that this, this, and this. Okay. Nichelle believes this, this, and this. Now, how are some of these things similar or different? This is another place where you can bring in your Venn diagrams and allow students to be able to have those conversations. I would even state that when I allowed students to have these conversations, there was always some form of graphic organizer involves because I do believe that students need that time to think. Um, that's the purpose of a graphic organizer, to organize your thoughts, to be able to say, okay, I get this. I would have some sentence stems to allow students to be able to have that discussion back and forth um, and really utilize my talk moves so that I can lead the conversation and guide the conversation to get to that common. Like we wouldn't leave with us being separate because the goal at the end of the day is to be able to say, yeah, you're from this community. You're from this community. You believe this, you believe this, but what is our common piece? Oh, the common thing between us is that we all love the country that we live in, or we all love that we are uh, blessed to be here. And so then at the end, we've all gotten to embrace and, and, um, acknowledge each other's, um, differences, but be able to come together and say, but guess what? we all agree about this. And then that aha moment, like, huh, we do. So this um, this quilt of America that we live in, all these different patches and different pieces are brought together to make something beautiful. Right. And I think that's, you know, that recognizing that it is a quilt and very much yeah. unique in that in the world, right? That, there, you know, America, and this is, uh, this, these are not my ideals. Uh, they are, they are, they come from people who are much smarter than me. But the unique thing about America is that we are a nation built on a common principle, not one built on common land, language, or heritage. Yes. Throughout all of history, nations were built on one of three or four criteria, which was you all lived in the same place, you mm -hmm. all had a similar background. Um, racial or ethnic, uh, or you all, um, uh, those are the two main ones. There are a couple more, but in the U.S., we don't all live in the same place. Living in North Carolina is very different than living in South Carolina even, but extremely different than living in Idaho or Arizona, right? Those are, we don't have a common place that we all experience. We also don't have a common heritage. We are a nation of immigrants, right? Yeah. There are more types of Americans than many than many other countries. The diversity within the United States is huge. So what is it, like, how is this even a question? How can all of those people from all of these different contexts form a, a nation that has anything in common? Um, and I think that's a big challenge for students to kind of wrap this up to challenge for adults, just humans. <laughs> But really a challenge for like adolescents who are like, who am I? What am I? Oh my God, what is a nation? That's like hard, hard to do. So one of the things that I've that I've explored and I think is a really powerful is that we're a propositional nation. And that term um, is a really powerful term. We are a nation committed to a proposition. And that proposition is that all men are created equal. We don't always fulfill that perfectly. But that is the argument for all increase in freedoms throughout American history. That is always the anchor, right? So when, you know, um, when civil rights movement was happening, they're like, ah, look at, like, it says it right there. It's literally black and white or Native American populations. Look, it's right there. They always turn back to that proposition to argue for their freedoms yeah. because it's there, right? Hasn't been perfectly executed. Um, it is not currently true that all men are treated, e all, all people are treated equally in the United States, but we at least have that in common as something that we aim towards yes. or should aim towards <laughs> yeah. in the United States as like a common, um, a common, common proposition, mm -hmm. right? And so that's a challenge for students, this kind of really difficult philosophical abstraction <laughs> That isn't something like you look like me or you sound like me or we have we eat the same food um, or you uh, you um, any other criteria that bind us together. Yeah. And you brought up you brought up like helping students think through these kind of complex ideas with different tools. Luckily, the Bill of Rights Institute put in our being an American. I love 
I'm just going to walk you guys through um, uh, lesson 11. So lesson 11 is our American heroes past and present lesson. And I love this lesson. First off, as a really great graphic organizer that will organize all of the different uh, different people that you're introduced to in this lesson. But then when they have what they're called hero character cards, which are these really short vignettes of this huge variety of Americans who are heroes that we can we can think about how they model American ideals in different ways, right? And it's all the people you would expect, like it's all the normal players that you like think about, like you know, John Quincy Adams and Frederick Douglass and Ben Franklin and Thomas Edison, but then it gets to ones that are Thomas Jefferson or Martin Luther King Jr. Or Abraham Lincoln. Um, but then it gets to ones who you may not always think about or may not know very much about. Ones like Mary Sukamoto, who was a um who was a, a li who lived her who devoted her life to ensuring civil rights for Japanese Americans. Mm -hmm. Or well, Ida B. Wells, most people should know, but she was also, she, until recently, I feel like until recently, she wasn't very well known. Yeah, I think she like, was limited recently, but I think, like, I, I think, think before, I think now people are seeing the expansion. Yeah, of, so I, th I, I almost feel like Black Lives Matter and like the, the George Floyd, like, gave her a resurgence because she was the one that wrote the original book, Lynch Laws, which kind yes. of showcased the horror Yes. Uh, that was happening in the South. And she was a journalist. She was an incredible woman. If you're not familiar with her work, um, highly recommend it. Um, but people like Jose Mendoza Lopez, um, who uh, was born in poverty in Mexico, went to Texas and was influ was very influential uh, at Pearl Harbor. Uh, uh, Joe, Albert Baez, Joan Baez's father, was uh, was a was a mathematician pacifist who refused to work on any of the military things happening in the 1940s, and his career was limited because of that. He was this genius mathematician, uh, and and others. So you have all these different characters, all these different models of heroic Americans that students engage with, and then this is the most fun part: we have them do a dinner party seating chart. So Ooh. what we ask them to do is complete the seating chart to show which Americans, so they have to choose six Americans to, or six from the list to add to a seating, to, to, to have at a dinner party. And then they have to like plan the dinner party. What questions would you ask? How do you think they would each react? Uh, what values do you share with these people? What differences do you have? What differences do they have among each other? Uh, and kind of how would the conversation go? And I love that lesson. I think that is such an intro, like a nice way and a very American way to think about how we resolve differences as Americans too, um, because we do, we are persistent. We're going to be in this for a while. We hope longer, this project of being Americans together. And we have to work through our issues. So often we have, you know, contentious or difficult things happen in the classroom. There's mm -hmm. a blow up or there's um, something becomes really emotional and we have to kind of backtrack and resolve it uh, because your classroom is a micro society and it is the number one place where young people get to practice the democratic processes of dialogue and dialectic. And so if we don't help them have these conversations in history classes, in English classes, in the humanities, they're likely to not learn how to do it. Um, and so what are you, and Michelle, in the book, you talk a lot about, uh, about strategies when things um, you know, start to get tense. Can you talk a little bit about how you've helped people work through those kind of um, difficult dinner conversations? <laughs> um, so I like to always start off with the first thing is self-reflection in that process. Um, and I say self-reflection because um, before we can, when things get heated or difficult, to be able to first step back and be able to reflect um, and reflect in, it's not this person, this person, this person. Did I say something to trigger this person and this person? Did I misinterpret what this person or this person said? Um, so that's always my first thing, self-reflect. The second thing I'm always will say is be ready to apologize um, or cite that hmm, maybe there was a misunderstanding there. Maybe you misheard or I misheard this or to re um, 
to really think about that. A lot of times we want to be superheroes. Um, um, and I say superheroes in the fact that superhero can do no wrong, right? Um, that they're saving and saving and saving and they didn't make any mistakes, right? And so the idea of being able to show vulnerability and being able to say, I am sorry, maybe that didn't come out the right way or may, um, I apologize if I hurt your feelings when I said the statement. I can see what I just said bothered you. Like those um, ideas. And believe it or not, in the book, we actually give sentence stems for students to be able to um, acknowledge that there's an error um, or that there's a, um, the conversation has diverged to a way that maybe we don't want, right? So that's the next one. The other thing is me and Joe talk about being prepared for this to happen. Um, a lot of times educators are not prepared for this to happen because in our mind, we're like, man, this is the lesson. Like, as I'm listening to you talk about this lesson, I'm like, this is really golden. Like, I love the people, you name some people that I was like, I've heard, but not really in detail. You name some people that I could totally rock it out and put them at tables, right? But when we plan it out, we're like, yes, this is the assignment. I maybe even go all out and set up tables with tablecloths. Like, I am ready. This is going to be it, right? And then the conversations start and I'm like, no way, what happened? So we talk about the book about being prepared for what you're talking about. What happens if it goes wrong? So um, I this idea is not mine. I'm gonna go ahead and preface that. Um, I like to do, um, I went to a training um, in Texas. I can't remember whose training it was. And they did an um, activity with, it's called the can of worms. Like we're gonna open this can of worms. And so um, how they did it was, we're gonna already talk about this. And then this can of worms, what's gonna happen is you're gonna pull them out. And these are gonna be um, citizens to help you um, keep the conversation going, even when you agree or disagree, or even formulate that disagreement. Because sometimes students are like, oh, I get it. I really don't care, right? So it's allowing them to say, I heard you say this, this, and this. But when you said this, I thought of this, this, and this, right? And so in an atmosphere like that, I would already have my sentence stems for agreeing and disagreeing um, available for students right in front. So as I set up this in my head, this lesson is really cool now. So I have my table with my tablecloths, like some um, with my little tea lights. I'm going to have my little talk moves and sentence stems around for my students. So if you get stuck or you hear someone say things, this is how we respond to that. Um, I'm also that teacher that would have um, reenacted it like I'm doing in this conversation. I would have picked a student who is probably my most um, animated and I would be like you're going to be my example today are you okay with that and we would have gone through this and I would have picked up my talk moves and said well when I heard you say this this and this this and go through that process so modeling it scaffolding it for them to see having the supports built in because a lot of times we forget those supports but having them there for, for being prepared you may not use them you may not need them but having them there ready for the conversation so I so to recap that idea of being self-reflective the next point to be able to admit vulnerability when we're um, when we may or may not have made a mistake, but to just acknowledge it, to have that empathy to say, "Oh, I hurt your feelings," and then the other piece would be as a um, teacher to be prepared with some type of way to guide the students to be able to get through that, to, to get get them back on track and yes. give them that time to to yes. to do that work. And so, what I I mean, I love I love that kind of pedagogical framework of of reflection and and the support structures because so I had the opportunity in my teaching career to teach in Guatemala City. Guatemala uh, so yeah cool. for, it was cool for two years I taught in Guatemala City um, and I don't I don't think people realize that the 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 democratic uh, di the, the democratic disposition towards dialogue mm -hmm. And being able to compromise and resolve our differences peacefully is not a given in society. It needs to be cultivated. Yes. Uh, I went into Guatemala um, very humbly. I, I knew that I was entering a community that I did not know anything about, um, but I was invited to, uh, to, to be the lead middle school teacher at the school that to lead the middle school and one of the things that I, I was helping them introduce was more dialogue-based programming more Socratic kind of discussion-based uh programs at the school uh and one of the things I had to, to I had to reconcile was the fact that 
culturally, you do not say what you think because it's actually dangerous because you don't know who's listening and you don't know what they will tell other people. And that can be dangerous for you and your family. And so we had to do a lot of work kind of it to even get to the point where they would be honest about what their opinion was. Mm. Because that's not something that they do. It is much safer for everyone involved to just sit and listen to a lecture. Yeah. Um, and that's a tragedy in it for for people for the humanity of those students that they that they are that they are they are um, you know culturally. It's not something that you do outside of a very small kind of family unit. Uh, and so that was a that was a huge lesson for me. And when I think and again reflect on kind of what makes America unique is in some ways this interest in dialogue, right? This dialectic that we are a democratic republic, that means we have to talk to each other. Yeah. We have to work our stuff out and we have to compromise. Yeah. I and agree. we have to practice that throughout our throughout our educational experience in order to get to the place when we're adults in decision-making authority yeah. uh, to be able to execute on it. Yeah. Um, so one of the uh, one of the other things I wanted to just touch on with you uh, is just this idea of the community of the classroom. So your your book is not just about civil dialogue, but it's in communities and building the community of the classroom. My background is very, you know, de Tocqueville influenced with associations. I was a super nerd. We have something like 20 volumes of de Tocqueville in my house between me and my husband. Uh, my daughter's name would have been Alexis if we hadn't already had a name picked out. Uh, <laughs> or my son, if I had had a son, his name would have been Alexis. We were very committed to Alexis de Tocqueville. Um, <laughs> and the role of associations in, in American society and that, that Americans come together and work together and they, they look to each other and their communities to solve problems. But, you know, the past... 60, 70 years, we've seen a kind of contraction in how people are part of societies and associations, bowling alone, Hillary Putnam kind of kind of things. And and honestly, the not having tight communities supporting schools yeah. as schools get bigger and bigger, um, they're not as they're not as close to their community. Uh, they're more distant. And so what do you know? What what do you work with when talking about building the community part in civil discourse uh, in the communities for for stronger communities? So um, to build a stronger community, um, you have to allow the community in. Um, and so um, and I'm not being fun I'm saying it funny, but I mean it. Like we. Um, so when with COVID, when it happened, the biggest thing was really allowing people to, um, parents were teaching their kids at home. <laughs> I was teaching third grade math. <laughs> um, then probably why she's struggling now. So that idea that we were doing all these things and we, we got to see into the classrooms. I'm going to be honest. I was one of those ones like, what is this, right? As a teacher, right? But, and then, so can imagine what other people were thinking like, why is it this way? Why does it look this way? I don't believe this and this and this. So now we are in a place now where we're still closing off those areas, but even more like I'm, I'm protective of what I'm teaching because I don't want to have anyone say that what I'm teaching is not what they agree with or what this, or I'm doing any of these things. So the first thing I would say is to really, when we talk about building those communities is you gotta allow the communities in. Now I'm not saying that we just open the doors um, with everything that's happened in America and be like, yes, come on in. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there is ways to allow people to be a part of a community. Um, the first place would be, um, I loved communicating with parents and I did this before a lot of people were really like internet everywhere. Like I worked in districts where we gave away internet to parents of low eco dis, uh, families. So that was, um, that tells you that the community, they couldn't do it, but I would send home letters, notes. And I would say elementary teachers have it down pat. I mean, 
that I think is a yellow folder now. That yellow folder coming home with what's going on, what's happening, whether I understand what's on there, I can look at that and determine it. I feel like after elementary, we kind of lose that um, vibe in informing people of what's going on in their class. That's actually, the, the research shows that, that there's a precipitous decline in parental involvement yes. after elementary. It's just, there. that's just, that's why parent engagement at the upper levels is so difficult because there's just not a core, there's not a core of enough parents that are involved to kind of bring the crowds. Um, yeah. So it's really hard. It's like a huge, just like a pew. Um, and so then changing that um, conversation, um, I will say I, I have a middle schooler and with that middle school, my email blows up. I also think it's in the district I work in. So they're probably like, let me make sure we let her know. But I'm going to say she does it for everyone, right? And so what this teacher does is informs, this is what we're covering this quarter, right? And so that small gesture um, opens the room and says, oh, in our um, in our quarter this um, this quarter, we are going to be looking at government and citizenship. And our overarching theme is how to um, how being an American today is important. And we're going to talk about this throughout. And we're going to study different heroes of history of different diverse backgrounds. Um, here is an excerpt of the information that um, we'll be providing. Please go over these um, important heroes with your children if you have time at dinner or in the pickup line or whatever. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. That's just off the brain right there. There you go. I open that up. We have to. And, uh, you know, I, I have this like pep project percolating, which is how do we support, how do we support that? What toolkits can we give? What trainings can we offer in our society that would allow the community to be welcomed in? What supports can we give to the schools that would let them have those kind of town halls and like really invite them into the conversation? Yes. Um, well, that, so I mean, that's the first step. I, I think that simple this is what we're doing. And so, and no one may respond at all. And that's okay. I guarantee you somebody read it. No one may or not respond at all. Then the next quarter, you do the same thing. So the, I'm talking about quarterly. So that's four times the whole year that I'm saying, um, let people know what's going on. I'm not saying you got to do this every week like those old no, teachers. No. I'm saying in secondary. Like, like secondary, those elementary teachers. Yeah, like those elementary teachers, <laughs> which I love. I love it. I, I totally get it. Not you do it quarterly. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so, I mean, I think this was a really wide ranging conversation and I'm so grateful. I think it was really, really fun and engaging and very compelling. Your, your experience and insights are really powerful. And I'm so grateful that you joined us for this. Is there anything that we didn't, that when I invited you to this webinar that you wanted to touch on that we didn't get a chance to? Um, I just, I just want to encourage people to one, <laughs> check out this lesson. This is really cool. <laughs> like I'm going to look at it. I've seen parts of it before. I don't think I've gotten to 11. So I'm like literally going to look and go straight to 11. Just want to let you know that. Um, but really, if you don't take anything else from this, the two, uh, the three things I want to say is set up the environment for your students to know that they can go through something like this and be successful. And then allow your stakeholders to be invited into this atmosphere so that they can even participate. That's um, the parents, that is um, school board members, your directors of social studies, your superintendents, your principals, your APs, your teacher next door that's like, I'm not doing this lesson. So then you can come and come see what it looks like. Allowing others to see what this looks like and how they can engage in it. And then allowing you to be vulnerable it's okay to be able to say, ah, I tried it. Eh, let me try again. And then of course, pick up the book and read more about it. <laughs> Which you can find on Corwin Press and yes. on the Bill of Rights Institute website is where yes. you can find our resource. Being an American is this, this uh, text that we've been working with. My incredible guest, Nichelle Pickney, thank you so much for joining me tonight. You're welcome. Thank uh, you for and I will, Yeah, I will see you all at the next one. Thank you so much.